I'm totally afraid. I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of losing. I'm afraid of being humiliated. But I'm totally confident. The closer I get to the ring, the more confidence I get. The closer, I'm more confident. The new definition of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. My confidence comes from both my faith and in the fact that I keep promises I make to myself. Feel com Borrow confidence from the past. Confidence. 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 There he is. Hey. Hi, Frank. Good morning, everybody. Let me see if I can. I'm not losing here. There we go. <clears throat> Hi, Pancho. How are you? Just fine. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you so much for like accepting my invitation. <laughs> because like I saw your conversation with uh, Carlos. He's my uh, one of my good friends. And it's very uh, late in the evening in India, correct? Yes, it's like 11.30 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> but me. it's like a, like a one-time opportunity for me to talk to you. So that's why I was like, yes, I need to do this. Well, and again, I'm sorry for all the delays that we had to keep no, rescheduled. No, no. This, this is just a part of the process. So okay. I want to yeah. take out these... Uh, here pieces because it makes it too loud so Ooh, there you go okay yeah good <laughs> yes like uh, how are you and your wife just fine just fine uh, my wife just recently had some major surgery but now everything is healing up and uh, she's still in a sling for about another three weeks but um she's tougher than i am so <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> she'll be fine okay. yeah yeah, and uh, like I have gone through your book and I know what you have gone through. But the thing is, I want to listen from you. What are the lessons learned from you? Like, uh, so that's why I contacted you to have a conversation with you. Because like... Uh, you that's were, fine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now and, we, have, we have a little bit of a delay. So if I have to say, huh? <laughs> okay. Your part, just a little bit of delay. Okay, okay. Okay? Yes. But it's amazing that here I am talking to you from Arizona clear over to India. I mean, it's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, 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 and even David in Wisconsin. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in your book, you dedicated your book to your wife. And you said, she found me when I needed to be found. Can you explain that? Uh, scenario like uh, your experience like why you have that sentence yeah and that, and that was a dedication to my wife and yes. uh, prior to meeting her I had gone through a bad divorce what divorce is good mm -hmm. but I just had some issues in uh, my personal life my first uh, professional career as you read in there that I was killed and brought back to life mm -hmm. a lot of pain a lot of uh, especially traumatic brain injury getting things working again just wasn't a good period of my life and then when after that accident when i met her and we actually started uh, a couple years later started getting involved in dating uh, she just brought that whole new joy to my life something more important to live for no more woe is me mm -hmm. hey let's, her and i as a team what can we do what can we accomplish like how you met her like uh, what can you share that moment with us well, she was she was the secretary for the Arizona Highway Patrol, oh, and, okay. and I, I had we knew each other, mm -hmm. and then she was also a traveling secretary for our twelve man motorcycle tax team when we travel all over the state of Arizona, mm -hmm. because we would arrest so many people, give the reports, she would get the reports written up for us, take them to the court. So we knew each other, but it wasn't until that accident when they 
made her my nurse <laughs> for a <laughs> few days that we started paying attention to each other. And then just uh, blossomed after that. And uh, fortunately, a couple of years later, it all came together. Awesome. And like, can you share what, what are the qualities you liked in her and what you learned from her? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one. What are the qualities you like in her and also what you learned from her? Well, we, we both kind of had the same mindset. Uh, we're both in the police field. She's a civilian employee, but still we had that same mindset. She knew what an officer had to go through on a daily routine. It's not always coming home at night at a certain time. She knew it could even be gone for weeks. And she knew that. She, she didn't like it, but she knew that. Where so many civilian wives don't understand that. They don't, they don't understand what a police officer has to go through. Not just a police officer, a doctor, a lawyer, so many people, even in the female side of the relationship, have these long work hours they have to do. But she understood it and worked with me. I, I recall, especially when I was a homicide detective, the call-outs at 3 in the morning. Um, I, I'd get out and start getting ready, and the first thing that I'd go on out the door, she's handing me a, sam a sack full of sandwiches and a thermos of coffee. She's up there making sure that I have everything to go. So is that partnership? Yes, that's understanding and the, the trust you have. Trust you build in the relationship. Yeah. <laughs> and like, uh, can you share what, like, how important it is to earn the right partner who believes in you and who supports you? Because I'm about to get married this year, so that's why I'm asking you that question. And the question was, uh, how important it is to find the right partner to support yes. you? Is that correct? Yes. Oh, yeah, in, in every relationship, of course. And, and we, <laughs> we, I like to say sometimes we have to, either him or her, have to kiss a lot of frogs to find the prince, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, again, someone with the mindset, mindset as you, someone that's going to, that you can work together to build whatever your, your goals are, especially when you have children. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the biggest thing. And the hardest job ever is being a step parent when it's your spouse's child, whatever it might be. And all of a sudden you're part of that family. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest job to be. And, and to just accept that and make that child know that you love that child. But like in my case, I have a stepson and I say, I'm not your father. Mm -hmm. You should love and respect your father. But I will do everything I can to be a father figure to you. But I, you know, I, I'm not going to try and take your father's place because that is your father. Because you got the same love from your stepmother. Yes, exactly. And I had a great relationship with my stepmother. Just yes. a very, as you maybe read in the book, a very close yes. relationship with my stepmother. And like, what are the lessons you learned from your own mother like because she left you at the age of two or three and also in some of the incidents she said I can't afford you anymore you need to be on your own so so many like hardships well it, it, it's very obviously very traumatic for any child to be in a situation like that I'm not the only one I mean this happens all the time but fortunately I had these mentors in this little town of 500 people uh, in the book, I describe Juan Delgadillo. Juan, yes. And then the Mexican widow lady that I lived with. Mm -hmm. uh, but the biggest thing they taught me was, and I still remember this today, no matter what your mother did, remember she is your mother and you will respect her. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have to love her, but I will respect, respect. her. Now, in later years, when we did reconnect, we, we had a relationship, but not that mother-son relationship but I never disrespected her. Mm -hmm. Yes, because like she gave birth to you. So that's why you are so grateful to her. Is that correct? Yeah, and also I learned that having a weird mother helps develop your character. <laughs> yes, yes. Like that is one of the main uh, thing I like I loved in your book. It says character is developed, not inherited. <laughs> And by the way, thank you for reading the book. I appreciate that. Like, I totally loved it. I didn't watch the movie, but I, I can imagine what had happened. Like, I imagine some of your situations, like, when reading. 
Well, if you do get a chance to watch the movie, you're going to find out uh, beginning of the movie it says based on a true story. Yes. <laughs> yeah, now Hollywood likes to do that, right? It's not the true story. Hollywood <laughs> likes to embellish. Hey. So you've read the book. Now, if you see the movie, you can see where Hollywood embellished some things, especially with the relationship with my father. In the movie, it shows that I didn't reconnect with my father until in my mid 30s. Mm -hmm. When in fact, in eighth grade, like uh, 12 years old, I did in fact reconnect with my father. And in the book, you also mentioned that uh, Yon acted both like a, he is your boss and also your friend. And sometimes he acted as a substitute parent. So he encouraged you like in your like uh, throughout your childhood until you become a, an young adult. So can you share experience with Yon and the mentorship you got from him? Well, yes, one one uh, such a mentor. And this was the first time at that age that we ever lived in a town, even mm -hmm. though this small town. And it's the first time I had high, or high school, grade school friends. But Juan was the one that I'd never been involved with sports. And he got me involved with sports. I never had any involvement with music. He got me involved with music. In fact, I think you saw in the book how to play yes. the drum in the, yes. in the dance band and so on. And that's only at 12 years old. But also got me uh, in, involved with rodeo because I thought I was going to be what they call a bull rider and junior rodeo. And I tried that for several times. I wasn't worth the darn, so that <laughs> career went away. But uh, again, the biggest thing that Juan taught me was how to give back. And an example, I don't know if I put it in the book, Juan, what do you mean? We, we're poor people are helping us. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have money to give back. You give back your time. Time, yes. Yes, and he gave the example of the widow Sanchez where I eventually lived with her for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Look at her front yard, it's full of weeds. Look, she's always bringing your mom beans and tortillas when she can. You can you're big enough, you can go clean that yard, help paint that porch. You don't have to have money to give back. Give back your time. And that's a lesson I stay with whole life. Now, with Juan's family, I am still very close friends. Juan passed away about now 14, 15 years ago. And I remain very close to him up until his passing. In fact, I was at his funeral. I was so honored to be invited to his funeral. But I say very close contact with the family. And in the movie, there's only three real characters with the real names, myself, my wife, and Juan. And I insisted on that because I want to honor that man with his family. Definitely. And then when we had the big Hollywood premiere, with the red carpet and everything, I made sure that the family was invited to walk that red carpet. And I introduced them after the screening, again, to honor their father, their grandfather. Awesome, awesome. You did like a, because you have that grateful and kind. Like you also learned kindness and how to be like a, have a, a gratitude towards your life. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. And then we're, we're also fortunate that we have those mentors. I could have gone either way. I'm this little kid by myself. I could have been the street urchin. I could have done whatever. But it wasn't just on. Also in high school, my teachers, my coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, going in the Air Force, the, the uh, commanders I had, the sergeants that I had, all saw something that just kept helping develop. And I like to say that, that your integrity and character are developed. They're not inherited. And you yeah. continue through your whole life to, to develop those two traits. Like, because like, uh, how important, like, uh, what is the role of a mentor in any, anybody's uh, life? I'm sorry, I didn't get that one. Like, what? Uh, how it is? Like, uh, how you find a mentor? Like, uh, for example, uh, I'm asking you a question. Like, how can I find a mentor? So. Oh, that's so difficult. The mentors have found me. <laughs> 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 I I haven't seeked them out, but I just happen to meet people now. Like my speaking career, mm -hmm. uh, for 35 years from Make a Wish, I was all over the country meet and greets, keynote speaking, and a gentleman heard one of my presentations, and I was just getting ready to retire from the police force. 42 years was long enough. And he said, how much do you charge for your speaking events? And I said, well, I don't charge. This is make wish This is our foundation. We don't charge anything. And he said, no, on the other circuit, on your professional speaking circuit. And I said, well, I don't do that. And he said, why not? He said, you realize how much money you can pay doing that? And I said, I, I never thought about that. So this gentleman 
he's in his 50s, in fact, late 40s, and I'm already in my early 60s, became my mentor at that age mm-hmm. and developed. And, and I had somewhat of a good speaking career, but he sought how to go to a different audience, not this what we call a stacked audience, to get this message out. And again, so fortunate to have that mentor in my life. And then with the movie, with the some of the producers, the directors I work with, mentors that now I'm in development, and David knows this, we can't talk about this <laughs> otherwise. We're in development for a possible new TV show that I will be hosting. Again, because of these mentors. Awesome. Like, uh, how do you find your passion? I know, like, uh, you went through so much of pain from uh, since your childhood, and also you met with a major accident. Like, uh, can you share that experience? Like, how you found your purpose from your pain? Well, I, I think we're all born into whatever a certain life might be. Uh, I never thought it was going to be a service life. Uh, I, I went into the Air Force because I couldn't afford college. I wanted to get the college education through that. Uh, after the Air Force, I went into the private sector with Motorola during the, the bis- missile program, development of that. But I, I just, I like that small town. I, I didn't like living in the big city and be going back into the police force. It was a great choice, obviously. But again, that years of service. But during those 42 years, I learned more and more about how we have to help people. I mean, we're there to protect and serve, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, David's a police, ex-police officer. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. And anytime you can help somebody, a, a child that's so hurt in, a, in an accident, whatever it might be, you get in a homicide scene to do, bring closure to the thing, just to give back to the community. And, and it's just there's certain people that want to do that. Like police officers, uh, there's gunfire. People run from it. We run into it. We want to help people. It's just that nature. And I'm going to close out on that particular question, too, is that we're, we're the one percenters, as they call it, of the total population. There's only one percent that wants to be to serve and protect. And we're those very minority, the one percenters. Like in, in your book, you mentioned that I wake up every day with a passion to make a difference in their lives. So like how you have that passion every single day, because like for uh, like for a normal people, it won't be possible. And right now, in this current situation, we need that passion and positive energy. So that's why, like, well, yeah, and, and, and we work eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, whatever it might be. But uh, I've got a grandson that's not working. He's got his first apartment. He's so thrilled. But I need extra money. And I said, well, excuse me, but you only work eight hours a day. What about the rest of the hours of the day? What do you mean? You can get that second job to earn more money to get what you want to receive but like right now i'm supposedly retired but i'm working like i say david david keeps me real busy on speaking engagements all over <laughs> but also working on this new tv show but i also set on seven nonprofit boards across the nation and that takes up so much time because these are all somewhat brand new and how we can develop these things and it, it the nonprofits include for the homeless uh, for foster children out of the system, for police officers injured in the light of duty, uh, for veterans, homeless veterans, for veterans group. So we're getting everything all combined with these different nonprofits. And that, that keeps them very busy. I'm not the guy that wants to sit on the porch. Mm-hmm. Of course, at, at about five o'clock in the afternoon, maybe with a, <laughs> a cocktail, it's kind of cigar, it's kind of nice. But uh, yeah, I've always been that adrenaline guy. I want to keep going. I want to keep doing things. And I got a little upset with the developers of this possible TV show because they said, this is going to be your last adventure, your last wish. And I said, wait a minute, guys, I'm old, but I'm not that old. Let's hope this goes on for a while. <laughs> <laughs> right. And like, uh, can you share your uh, morning routine? Is there anything specific you do every single day to keep that positive mindset? Well, and, and my wife gets so upset on this, is the first half of the day is on the computer. Oh, okay. Just answering, answering emails, answering David. He's bugging me every day. But Now, I'm so flattered because, because of this movie, uh, I get either through David or personal emails, um, responses 10 to 20 every day about what this movie impacted them. Mm-hmm. And I'm so flattered to receive that. 
And I want to take the time, we don't have a secretary to do this. So I want to take the time to personally answer every one of those. And, and just a couple of days ago, David Ford went to me, or maybe you didn't, but a, a, young, a nine-year-old girl from Ireland, her oh. family saw the movie. She was just so enthralled with the movie, but especially how to give back. And she said, I have very long hair. And I cut my hair very short and sold. You can sell. I didn't know that. You could sell that hair. And the money she got, she donated to the Make-A-Wish Foundation of Ireland. I mean, yeah, it's just amazing. Yes. Now, you, well, you have to watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, like, I promised myself that I also have, like, a long hair. So I want, I also decided to give my hair, donate my hair to cancer patients. Yeah, and, and like I told her, she's the perfect example. Of everyone can be here with the message of the movie. Everyone can be here. She's giving back. Nobody asked her to do that. She yes. is nine years old, and she's doing that on her own. Yes. And, like, how do you believe in yourself? I'm sorry, what? How do you believe in yourself? Because all the times you won't be positive, right? Okay, I couldn't get that one. David, did you hear that one? Yeah, how do you believe in yourself? Oh, wow. Um, whatever God gave me, I guess, is the answer. Yeah, I, 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 try, I try and do the right thing. You know, in the United States right now, there's all the controversy uh, about the gentleman that was killed mm -hmm. uh, during yes. the arrest. And I did a couple shows on that. And in my whole police career, I know in David's police career, we never used excessive force. We were never trained to do something like that. We were guided by our supervisor of the training, but also guided by God. We're, we're not going to go against God's will on anything. So, and again, as a police officer, all the years we work, David, the same thing. We go to work every day. I've never worked with a police officer that doesn't believe in some type of a higher being, or whatever the religion might be. Yes. We go to work every day. We say a little prayer. Please allow me to come home. We get home at night. We say a little prayer. Thank you for allowing me to come home. And it's the same thing on a job. When we do uh, search warrants, uh, when I was working narcotics, busting indoors, the whole group got together beforehand, a little remote site. We all said a little prayer. Please allow us to get home. And also, please allow us not to hurt anybody. The last thing we want to do is take somebody's life. The last thing we want to do. So in answer to your question, I'm just kind of guided by God. Hey, did I do it right today? Like, do you, if some, like, if you do anything negative or any harm, like, how do you feel in yourself, like, uh, um, I couldn't hear that one, David. I'm if just trying to get a break. Yep, that's okay. If you do anything negative during the day or something bad happens, how do you kind of get through that and, and boost yourself up? Oh, well, and that all happens to all of us, right? We got hiccups. It's not all rainbows and lollipops. <laughs> we, we all get these hiccups in life. And again, as again, Juan, a very young, taught me to always try and turn those negatives into the positive and use those negatives as a learning experience how to do something different the next time you try. So yeah, we all we all make mistakes. We all do things. We just say, oops, let's try it. Let's try and turn this around and figure out how to do it the right way. Or I'm not gonna I'm not gonna smash my finger with that hammer again because I'm gonna hold my finger down. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Like is there any worst day in your life? Worst day. Any uh, again uh, uh, Delayed, David. Help. Uh, what is your worst day of your life? Or what was the worst day? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, well, don't we have hundreds and thousands of them? got to realize how old I am. <laughs> I've had a lot of worst days. <laughs> maybe maybe getting up to it or getting thrown off a horse or uh, hit by a bull or whatever it might be, but uh, thrown off a motorcycle. I mean, it, it just always happens. So I, I never consider it a worse type okay. thing. Yeah. And like you met with a major accident in your life and uh, like can you briefly explain that scenario, like what you had gone through and what, what were your thoughts during that time? Okay, again, David, I've got this lay on my end. That's okay. Um, talk through your accident, the one where you were pronounced dead and kind of your mindset and uh, just kind of your thought process through that whole event. Well, yeah, and that obviously a very traumatic thing in my life. Um, 
and police officer, you can't work every day without having a little humor, uh, things that go on. I was told the accident was very spectacular. Uh, obviously, I didn't remember, but I had to go through a lot of therapy following because I had traumatic brain injury, a lot of injuries, and then also counseling before I went back to work to make sure my mind was okay to go back to work. And the counselor said, do you remember going through the tunnel? And I had no idea what they were talking about. And a lot of people, when they die, uh, emergency room situations, uh, as your life goes away, you're looking at a light like a tunnel and it goes out. When the light is gone, you're dead. And as they bring you back to life, that little light pinpoint starts opening up. It's like the tunnel and they're bringing you back to life. And I recall that. And they brought other things. Do you recall anything, seeing anything? I saw, I saw my little girls. They were laughing and giggling. Do you recall anything about your senses coming back? And I didn't even think about that. I said, what do you mean? Well, your sense of smell, touch. I said, well, I, I do now, as a matter of fact. I remember the sense of sound, hearing. I can hear sirens in the back, or I can hear somebody yelling, she's brought them back, she brought them back. I don't know what they're talking about. But the sense of smell, something very pleasant, something very sweet, like a perfume. Uh, the sense of touch, something is tickling my face, something is on my lips. The sense of sight, I open my eyes and there's this beautiful blonde with a lip lock on me. <laughs> <laughs> and if this is heaven, this is okay. I'm happy with this. But I also said, and the counselor said, well, what about your, your partner? Do you remember him? Because he tried to revive me also and it obviously didn't work. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm so happy that I didn't wake up to him because the sense of sight with him, the sense of smell, touch, a big ugly guy, big mustache full of bugs. I mean, that would have been so traumatic. So, <laughs> but the last thing the counselor said to me is God spared you for a reason, and now you have to find that reason. And it was two years later that I was introduced to a little boy named Chris. Chris, yes. <clears throat> like, can you share that experience with Chris and also the experience with the second, like a uh, second uh, wish? you fulfilled well it changed my whole life <clears throat> obviously and that was still in that depression part of my life mm -hmm. but that just changed my whole life my whole aspect <clears throat> now we, we deal with dying children weekly <clears throat> on accidents and so on or homicide scenes, whatever it might be but to actually interact with the boy that he knew he was going to die I, I can't even imagine for a seven-year-old even today they only know they have a couple weeks to live but to bring joy to somebody that is not on an accident scene or a crime scene, to give them their last few days of just happiness. That meant so much to me, and that we could continue to do that. That was the biggest thing. A whole new direction in my life. Like, uh, when you got that thought, I need to start, like, how you got that thought? I know you worked with, like, you fulfilled that uh, first wish of Chris. But, like, uh, do you have that belief and the, uh, a strong passion in you at that moment. I can do this. Like uh, I need to do this. Oh, definitely, definitely. We came back flying home from the funeral in Chicago, and like I, I point out in the book, um, I've had this idea. Let's. He had a wish. Let's find other children like that and let them make a wish, and we'll make it happen. And that became our new passion. Now to start the foundation in Arizona, we had to have five like-minded people or four other to start a foundation per the government rules, the Arizona state rules, and finding those four other people because they all said, no, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. We would have never heard of anything like this. But again, I remember my childhood from one, oh, turn those negatives to positive, find a way to make it work, which I and we did because we finally found those other people. Uh, and that was my, my passion. I never took a salary with Make-A-Wish. Because every money that came in went to the mission. But we had to have money to start with. So I'm starting to work. Police officers are very fortunate. We can get a lot of off-duty jobs, as we call it, provide a special personal security for celebrities and so on. And I'd get off my shift, and then we'd go work another eight-hour shift. And after that, go work a four-hour shift, working 20 hours a day, and that money going into the foundation. Because that was my passion. That's what I wanted to do especially when you get so tired, I can't do this anymore. And then our coordinator from the hospital comes, I've just learned of another wish shop. We have to get some money to grant this wish. So the kids were always the motivation. Like you mentioned that you used to work for 20 hours a day. And because like 
you have that habit of working since your childhood because like you did so many odd jobs like, yeah and again fortunate to do that now i had a great commander that when we first officially got the make wish foundation going he called me into his office now when the commander calls you into your office you're thinking oh boy i'm in trouble <laughs> and you usually are you usually are but he said frank i know what you're doing he said i'm going to support you as much as i can in fact we're going to give you an empty office space to use this is before the days of internet anything uh, cell phones we're going to give you an office to use copy machines typewriters there was no such thing as computers right then <laughs> And everything he said, but what I want is I want you to make sure you give me an eight hour shift, an eight hour work. It may take you 15 hours to do that, mm -hmm. but I want you to give me eight hours because I was always one of the guy highs on the drug arrest, the DUI arrest, and so on. And I so respected that man, and I did that. I'd go in, I'd work a half a day, I'd go in and do the stuff for Make a Wish, the office they provided, and then I'd go in and work whatever I could to get that full eight hours in. And like he said, sometimes it took 15, 18 hours to do that. And I'm like, uh, I Bear with me, I'm getting, okay, never mind. I started getting the strange message on my uh, screen. I also got that message. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like how important it is to work uh, uh, from your young age? Like, uh, can, what is your advice to the students? How important, again, David, I had a like, little delay here. I did too on that one, actually. Uh, yeah, like how important it is to uh, do a part-time jobs from the student age, like from the end age. Like what is his advice to the students? Oh, uh, advice to like students when you want to, you know, talk about part-time jobs and, and how important that is as a student. Well, yeah, and a student, and I, I started working full time at ten years old, only because I had to. It was a survival thing. Mm -hmm. But any any student, uh, when they're old enough to work, to be responsible to work, uh, first of all, it builds up an ethic in them. It helps build a work ethic is the most important thing. Whether it's flipping hamburgers or whatever it might be, mopping floors, what whatever you can do. Plus, all of a sudden, it starts giving you a little bit of financial knowledge of how you can have your own money. Not just doing maybe chores at home and getting an allowance, but having your own money. And then again, that helps build your character, your integrity. And you, you go to school, what, four, five, six hours, seven hours a day, whatever it might be, but, and you've got your homework. That's your biggest responsibility. In fact, I tell my younger grandchildren, you have a job. Well, no, I don't, Grandpa. I, I go to school. I said, that's your job. Your job is to go to school and earn good grades. And, and make make an education for yourself. But as they get a little bit older, you've got that spare time. So let's go out and learn the work world because you're gonna be doing that the rest of your life. And like you had like a diff difficult childhood and when you want to have a kid, like what are your thoughts? What you told yourself? Like how you, like what kind of a parent you want to be uh, for your kids? Yeah. Did you get that, David? I apologize yeah. because we're getting a little bit of way on our end. <laughs> um, just with your, your rough upbringing, you know, what did that take then when you became a parent and how you wanted to parent your own children? Well, and I, I tried to accept, well, I'm not going to put them out at 10 years old to work. <laughs> but <laughs> you, as a parent, you always want a better life for your child than you have. But I'm not going to spoil them if they wanted something even at home with little chores, uh, they're very young. Uh, I, I want a new Barbie doll. Well, okay, you know what, I'm gonna get you that Barbie doll, but you know what, mom needs help with the dishes. Mom needs a little help with this, or dad needs a little help. And just a little thing, and then all of a sudden, it's a sense of reward for them. You that, thought hey, how to it. earn it. Yeah, and, and then we'd ma I'd make it a big deal, at, let's just say example of a Barbie doll, take them to the store, let them pick it out, give them the money, and let them pay for it mm -hmm. and it's just oh wow look at what i just did awesome. and I, I tried to do that then in their teenage years they started working the part-time jobs like most teenagers do and just encourage them encourage it dad i need to get to work i can't i don't have a car well you know what i'm going to drive you back before i'm going to help you out as much as i can and like what to do if you don't have like encouraging parents or encouraging surroundings 
I'm sorry, David. I yeah, I missed that one too. Everything froze up. Uh, like, what? Uh, what is your advice to the student who don't have uh, a good environment or a good supporting system from their parents? Uh, what advice would you have for students that don't necessarily have a good support system or a good home life with parents and whatnot? Well, especially students, and hopefully you have teachers, teachers that could be your mentors. Obviously, a teacher, learn from them. Uh, ask them questions. Teachers are there to help the students. I've never had a teacher in high school, college, grade school that didn't want to help, that didn't want to give a little bit of extra effort. Uh, when, when I went from this one little town to where I currently live, going from grade school to high school, my math skills were not up. They wanted to put me back in what we call the eighth grade because I couldn't pass the math test to go into high school. And I was trying out for football. And my football coach says, you're going to be on the first string your freshman year. And he then learned that they were going to put me back in eighth grade. And he said, no, they're not. And worked with me all summer, tutoring me on math. And then when I took the test just before school started, I passed with flying colors and was got into high school, got to play football. But again, that teacher that took that extra time. And, and you, you can seek those out. Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, I need a little bit of help on this. Take advantage of why they're there. Like uh, you believe that asking for help is a real strength. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Don't don't sit back and feel sorry for yourself. Whatever. Yeah. I remember my again my mentor Juan. He said, "Never feel sorry for yourself." He said, "You know what? You only got one meal today. You only got to eat one time today. But you know what? You got to eat one time today. There's so many people that did not get to eat today." Yes. And like, uh, do you have any regrets in your life? Do I have any what in my life? Regrets. They, regrets? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> any big one? Like, uh, big one. It, it's a shame I couldn't keep my first marriage together. It's a okay. shame that my children had to go through the divorce parent type thing. Uh, especially living in different states and apart, but I always tried to make up for that. Uh, it, it's a shame I couldn't do be more successful at the beginning of the Make-A-Wish, that we wanted to do more and more, but eventually that did happen. Um, there's just so many regrets that we all have every day. Uh, I regret I kind of slept in today and get up in time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, and and, and I, I regret right now that we're having this little bit of a delay. <laughs> where I repeat the questions. Okay, no, that's a small regret. <laughs> yes, like, uh, what is the real success in your perspective? Did you get that? what is? Yep, what is real success in your perspective? Oh, why well, it's not it's not money. Mm -hmm. I mean, who who doesn't want money, right? Uh, people used to say money can't buy you happiness, and I said, well, nobody can buy me a brand new Harley Davidson motorcycle, and that would make me happy. But <laughs> but it's just what you do with your family, yourself, giving back to your community. What is your legacy mm -hmm. uh, when you pass away? Is it going to be an obituary, and that's it? Your name is never going to be brought up again. Or is your name going to come up 10 years later? Oh, I remember what he or she did. I remember that. That to me is more important than anything, a legacy that you live behind. Awesome. Like, uh, these are the questions I have. And, and like, I want to ask you, like, how I did this conversation and how I did this interview. I want to get a feedback from you because you are one of my mentors. David, did you... Yep, she just wants to know how she did on this interview, and she appreciates your, your input and your feedback. Oh, you did fantastic on the interview. It was, so, it was so easy talking to you outside of the little delay we had right here. But, I mean, you obviously researched, and that's very important to me when somebody wants to do an interview, a podcast, that they research first mm -hmm. instead of just coming like, well, what did you do? They have no idea. And you did your research. You read the book. That's the biggest thing is you read the book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was very well put together on your part. You had the questions down. 
And I appreciate you wanting to talk to me. I mean, it's very flattering that you wanted to do that. Because like I felt it's like a one time opportunity for me. So that's why I was like, yes, I need to get this. <laughs> <laughs> well, great, great. Yeah. And no, like my my whole family is sleeping, and I'm I'm like a sitting in small room, full of objects. <laughs> <laughs> well, fo follow us on Facebook. Follow us on our website. Mm -hmm. uh, David just David just put together a brand new website for me. It's got all the information on there. Wishman Wishman Bundle. He's gonna he's gonna get a big head, but I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like one small question, like can you share your experience as a cowboy and how what you learned from that? Because like I love your hat. <laughs> and what was the question then? Like what you learned from yeah. Your experience as a cowboy. <laughs> well, I was raised I was raised as a cowboy. I like to follow what they call the, the cowboy way ethics. Uh, and, and again, that is honor God, country, your your parents, everything else. Don't steal, don't whatever, and kind of live that life, like the ranch life. And uh, the, the kids love the cowboy hat. Whenever I see yes. a Jewish kid, they want a picture wearing my hat. And also, the good-looking ladies want a picture wearing my hat. And it's a shame I can't put this on you right now. But, <laughs> but thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And All right, well, we're going to have to close this. Sure, yes. The kind yeah. of done, yes. And thank oh. you, thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, you're welcome. Like we do in the West. So long. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so All much, right. Dave. Thanks, Dave. You're very welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All Take right. care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. There's a difference. I want to do it, and I want to be a rock star. Right, like, and that's where you influence people. Like, you know, like I want to do it, but I also want to be the most popular. And so then that person's like, oh, I want to be him. So I guess I'll be nice. Like, I want to literally take people who have DNA that's kind of nice and make them more nice.